Well, uh, what we need to do today is to prove the basic inequality of used in the uh, discussion of the positive energy theorem. This, I must admit, is one of the more unpleasant manipulations that one has to go through. Uh, I think it's important to see how it's done uh, and the fact that it can be done. Um, perhaps it does not matter too much if you don't get all of the details absolutely straight. The real point is the principle of the thing. And let me remind you of what was going on. We had some space-time here which was asymptotically flat. A surface sigma sitting in it on which one had a unit time like normal everywhere and the induced metric on this surface. And we had discovered the mass equivalent to the ADM mass, sorry, the gravitational mass was equal to minus 1 over 8 pi integral of TAXB DSAB integrated over space-like infinity, a two-sphere sitting out there, where x was a vector field which lay entirely in the surface sigma. It was equal to epsilon bar, uh, sorry, epsilon dagger del A epsilon H A B. So this thing is a vector field lying entirely in sigma. And epsilon obeyed the Witten equation. Namely, uh, H A B gamma A del B epsilon is equal to zero. And our curved space Dirac matrices, these things here, are related, of course, to the flat space ones by gamma A equals E A mu gamma mu. So there are two properties of those that I will need one of which is kind of obvious, since gamma mu, gamma nu, anti-commuted with each other, gives you twice eta mu nu times unit matrix. It follows that the space-time gamma matrices will then, when anti-commuted with each other, will give you gamma A, gamma B, is equal to twice GAB times unit matrix. And the covariant derivative of gamma is equal to zero. I want to emphasize that's a choice, again, consistent with the fact that the covariant root of the metric and the Fermines are equal to zero. We're now set to prove the basic inequality. This thing is a surface integral, and our strategy for dealing with these things when trying to prove something nice about them is to turn them into integrals over sigma. So if we do this, we can just use uh, the divergence theorem. And you will get, from application of the divergence theorem to that, um, probably we want to take one further step before we do that. M is minus Remember that this thing is anti-symmetric under the interchange of A and B, and it's easier to put in an anti-symmetrization there before you start taking the divergence. That's so that you can guarantee that you've actually taken the divergence of the right thing. So the first step is to explicitly carry out this anti-symmetrization. Now apply Gauss's theorem. This is going to be the integral over the surface sigma of the divergence of this thing. 
So you'll get minus 1 over 16 pi del A of that particular object TAXB minus TBXA. And then you'll end up with just the determinant of h to the 1 half d3x times tb. That is the only complicated step in the thing. The rest is manipulation of the various quantities involved, which unfortunately is not completely straightforward. So the first thing to do is just to multiply out the covariant derivatives. We've got the covariant derivatives of four things here, so there are four terms that we have to look at. What you will discover is that the complications mushroom and then collapse dramatically at each stage. So the first thing you'll end up with here is del A T A times X B T B. So you just differentiate this term. This is zero because x lies in the surface sigma. That is to say, x is orthogonal to t. The second term here you get by looking at del A of xb. So you will get plus ta tb del A of xb of which there is no simplification. The third term you get, del A TB, TB XA. So that's minus del A of TB, TB times XA. And the last term you get is minus TB, TB del A of XA h to the half d3x. This term here is 0 because tb of del A tb is equal to a half of del A tb tb. And because t is a unit time-like normal to the surface sigma, this is always equal to minus 1. And so its derivative is equal to 0. So this term gives you nothing. And equally well, this term here just gives you a further minus sign. So you end up with minus 1 over 16 pi. And there are just two terms left. TATB times del A of XB. And then this term. Uh, this term here, which is going to be plus del A XA, which I'm going to write as GAB del A of XB. That is, of course, the same thing. And now you can recognize GAB plus TATB as just equal to HAB. So the tool that you're interested in is just the covariant derivative, well, almost the divergence of x, but not quite, integrated over that space-like hypersurface. So what you have to do is to construct a nice-looking expression for this relatively simple object. And recall the nature of x. It's given by that vector field sitting up there. There is no simple way of doing this. You just have to slog through it. HAB del A X B is, when you substitute in, HAB del A of a Epsilon dagger del C, Epsilon H C B. And you can sort of see that this is going to give you exactly what you want. 
if you take the covariate derivative terms here, you will see that you almost get something that you would like. The first term is the covariant derivative of the emission conjugate of epsilon times the covariant derivative of epsilon. This is a second H A B epsilon dagger del A del C epsilon H C B. And then there's lastly a term which is involving the derivative of the uh, induced metric. Right. Shouldn't I have a B on the first thing? H A B H B C. I should probably have a C here. Well, I'll do. I'll do it in two steps. first term is almost nice. Since H is a projection, HAB, HBC is the same as HAC. So this is HAC del A of epsilon dagger del C of epsilon. Uh, and the, sec the third, second and third terms are less easy to deal with. Um, what you can really do is HAB, HBC is again HAC. So this is HAC, epsilon, dagger, del A, del C, of epsilon. And then this thing I'm going to leave exactly as it is, although you can obviously replace it by something that involves the second fundamental form and the acceleration vector. This thing is almost positive. The way to see this is just to think about what it means morally. Were it the case that you took a complex vector V, and you found H A B V A dagger V B, you would, that would be positive, or zero. And it would be zero if and only if V was zero. That's because H A B, the metric on the surface sigma, is a positive definite metric. So you could, for example, take locally inertial coordinates or normal coordinates and say what this is really would be something like the sum of vi dagger vi, sum from i is 1 to 3 in local coordinates. So that would be exactly what you wanted. So were it exactly that, it would be positive definite. And that would be almost enough to prove that uh, you had to have positive mass. There is a problem. The problem is that this dagger is sitting inside the covariant derivative, not outside it. And then you've got some extra junky terms here. This thing, which is horrible, and this thing, which is almost but not quite the square of the Witten operator. I have a question from the from last time, but where, where did we uh, come up with our complex structure to define our emission hadron? Epsilon dagger is equal to epsilon transpose 
complex conjugated. Yeah, but to, to, to complex conjugate, we need, to, we need to have a complex structure. Everywhere in space time? No. Just on the tangent space at each point. So, I mean, if your epsilon was of the form of epsilon plus i epsilon 2, etc., then epsilon dagger is epsilon 1 minus i epsilon 2, epsilon 3 minus i epsilon 4, etc. Yeah, I know, but that's, but, you've, but that's a specification of a particular map, right? And you could presumably have other complex structures. Never mind, it's, it's That's what I mean. <laughs> Are you worried about complex structures in space-time? Yes. That's a bit different because I haven't made the com I haven't made the coordinates complex. Mm. So. That is to say, I'm not trying to do something like x a plus i y a is equal to z a. I don't want to define a complex. That, I mean, if I was going to do something like that, where these things were real, to produce complex coordinates, that would be a different story. Then how do we develop our epsilon, epsilons? We're not doing that implicitly. Well, what I require is for this to exist at each point in space, time. So it's just an tangent space thing. Oh. Whereas this would, if I were going to talk about things being holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, it would be a global thing, and that would be more complicated. So now we have to learn how to deal with this problem. What we really want to do is to write that as um, del A epsilon dagger. Now, so what we need to do, first of all, is to find what transforms as a conjugate spinner. know that if you were dealing with a flat space calculation, psi bar would be equal to Dirac conjugate psi dagger times gamma zero. So what you do in general relativity is just to replace this by psi bar is psi dagger gamma a t a, where t a is any unit time-like vector. So this thing is just the sort of covariant replacement of uh, gamma zero, there's a certain amount of arbitrariness in how you define it, but because we have a unit time like normal everywhere to the surface sigma, this is a perfectly reasonable way of doing it. It will do the job for you. So that means that if you have psi dagger, that's going to be the same thing as minus psi bar gamma b t b. And if you don't believe that, the simplest thing to do is to substitute in, and you will get for psi bar, and you can see that that's consistent, because minus psi bar gamma b t b is equal to minus psi dagger gamma a t a gamma b t b. We have the product of two gamma matrices. Therefore, you can replace it by just g a b. And g a b t a t b is the same as minus 1, because it's a unit vector, and it's time-like. So you end up with plus psi dagger. So that's how you go from psi dagger to psi bar and back again. That is somewhat related, but when we defined our our gammas in the, with tangent space indices, I, I 
perfectly okay with the humanity joints and things like this in the tangent space index. But, but once, once we've gone to the, uh, I mean, to the target space, I mean, we're... Space-time, you space mean? Space-time, I mean, so, so, I mean, why do we have a global end joint? And, I mean, because now we're doing end joints. Uh, we're okay because we have guaranteed that there is a unit time-like vector perpendicular to sigma absolutely everywhere. So there is a TA that we could use. Of course, we could use lots of different TAs by varying the surface. But because there is such a thing, we can guarantee it exists. Of course, that's part of the conditions of the positive energy theorem. Uh, more subtle. I don't, okay. it, the problems would come if that didn't exist. But just, it also seems rather lucky because, it, because our definitions of the space-time gammas are, are exactly what we would have naively expected. You know, with the uh, anti-commutator being metric. Well, that's exactly because we defined the map between the tangent space in this way. I mean, because gamma A is E A mu gamma mu, yeah. the Clifford algebra for the flat space ones induces the Clifford algebra that I wrote down, it's slightly more complicated, for the uh, space-time ones. So it's, it's more than fortunate, it's sort of inevitable. Okay. Well, I mean, you might be able to find other ways of doing it, but I don't think it'll, they won't come out to be very nice. Um, now. So, given that, what do we mean by del A epsilon all dagger? That's the same thing as minus del A of epsilon barred gamma B TB. And because of the way in which we define covariant derivatives, this has got to be the same thing as minus del A of epsilon bar. I don't wish to prove that. It will take us longer than we have. You can just take that as being a fundamental rule. But this is the same thing as minus del A of epsilon dagger gamma C T C gamma B T B. And so there will be a relationship between this and what we've actually got. So you have del A of epsilon dagger times gamma C T C gamma B T B, which of course will give me a minus one. And then there'll be a covariant derivative of the unit normal. That's going to give me a plus epsilon dagger gamma C del A T C times gamma B T B. So this thing is equal to del A of epsilon dagger plus a correction term. allowed me to change this minus sign into a plus by mistake. That should be a minus. So when we come up to this expression here, we have to assemble it to give us what we want, which is H A C, del A of epsilon all dagger, del C of epsilon which is positive, plus a term here, which looks a little bit like the square of the Dirac operator or something of that kind. This correction term, which is horrible,
You see, this is really the gradient of t, because if you replace h by g plus tt, then you'll end up with the gradient of t there with two such terms. And then there's another gradient of t term from here. So you end up with, lastly, minus epsilon dagger gamma c del a of tc times gamma b tb. Someone's claiming I've got a si an index wrong. Psylon dagger. Absolutely right. You say I've got a sign wrong. HAC as well. Oh, I see what I've done wrong. Let's try again with that term. It's plus HAC, Epsilon dagger, gamma C. Uh, I better call it gamma D del A T D and put a bracket around it, otherwise we'll end up in a mess. Gamma B T B. What are we left with? Del C epsilon. Okay. So, we have now, let me write up what I think it is that we're supposed to have. I must say that the, the, the opportunity for error in this formula is quite amazingly large. m is equal to 1 over 16 pi. It's the one thing which teaches you to do careful calculations, actually. Integral over sigma. Hmm? No, no minus. I am going to summarize where we've got to. And there is no minus sign in this. So that's the uh, squared, the thing which we know to be positive. Then there is a term which we're going to have to look at carefully, which is more or less that thing. And then there are two terms which I'd like to disappear. So that's one of them. And the second one is this. Um, so we need to look carefully at this term now. Our original expression graph had minus 1 over 16 pi. And then we got over sigma. I absolutely guarantee that this one has got a plus sign in it. Uh, let's see. Uh, for those who wish to challenge my signs, You have to be careful with this, so uh, perhaps I have not been careful enough. The place at which you said I had a minus sign was here, 1 over 16 pi, and then I ended up with TA, TA del B X B minus TB del B X A of TA. Does anybody wish to dispute that equation? Yes. Is it?
Let, let me try again then. If you m is minus one over sixteen pi, the integral over sigma of del b of t a x b minus t b x a t a h to the half d three x. Do we all agree on that? Good. No. I think it's when we use the vertices. Oh, that is true. You had a del A at the start. Oh, <laughs> then the minus sign should have come there. <laughs> if I re replace it by a del A, then that's where the minus sign has come from. My apologies. This is what my notes say for sure. <laughs> So, this is what you're supposed to have. I said the important thing is to keep sight of what it is you're trying to prove. I'm tempted to make a joke about a negative energy theorem, but uh, let's not do that. <laughs> so, what we know is that a Poisson obeys the Witten equation. Which we know to be H A B gamma a del b epsilon equals zero. If I make a further sign mistake, please tell me when I do it. <laughs> so the technique is to square the Witten operator. So this must be true. H, C, D, and of course it would be helpful if I made absolutely sure that what I wrote down is what I've written down in my notes as well. So we know that to be true. So when you collect up terms here, you have the covariant derivative of an h, that's another unpleasant term, and then essentially something squared. So you end up with h c d del c del d of h a b. So that's another term involving covariant derivatives of t. And then there will be the second derivatives of epsilon. H, C, D, H, A, B, gamma, C, gamma, A, del D, del B of epsilon. And that's equal to zero. The way to make progress here is to replace this part, gamma, C, gamma, A, by the sum of the symmetric and the anti-symmetric parts under the interchange of C and A. This I'm going to leave alone. It isn't going to do anything for a bit. The bit that's symmetric under the interchange of C and A is just the metric tensor. So that's G, C, A. The bit that's anti-symmetric, I can write as gamma CA, just the commutator of two gamma matrices. And then you have a del D, del D, epsilon, and that's equal to zero. So you're left with an unpleasant term, HCD, gamma C, del D of HAB, gamma A, del B, Epsilon. Then we have a term here where C is contracted with A. Well, if C is contracted with A, that thing just turns into an HDB because it's a projection operator. So you end up with that term. That term, if you look at it carefully, is the same thing that appears here. Then there's a bit which is anti-symmetric under the interchange of C and A. If this is anti-symmetric under the interchange of C and A, it makes this bit here anti-symmetric under the interchange of D and B. And that in turn means that you can replace this covariant derivative operator, the two of them, by their commutator. So this becomes H, C, D, H, A, B, 
gamma C A del D del B epsilon. And all that is equal to zero. That means that whenever I see this expression, I can replace it by this horrible thing and that thing. This term on the face of it looks awful. But, of course, you can replace it by the curvature tensor. So using the Ricci identity, you get plus one quarter H C D H A B gamma C A R D B E F. Let's write it up there. Gamma E F gamma E F Psylon. And that's equal to zero. So what that means is that in this expression here, you can replace this term by another horrible term of this type and a term involving the curvature tensor. So let's summarize what you get as a result of doing that. You will discover that m is equal to 1 over 16 pi. The integral of h a b del a of epsilon dagger del b of epsilon minus 1 quarter of epsilon dagger h c d h a b r d b e f gamma c a gamma e f epsilon together with three correction terms which are the second and sorry third and fourth ones there And then we need this correction term, which is minus epsilon dagger h c d del d of h a b gamma c gamma a del b epsilon. These three terms here, I'm going to forget about for the moment. In actual fact, after the use of the Witten equation and multiplying things out, these actually turn out to vanish. Not individually, but together. We will try to prove that. But what I want to do is to concentrate on this term here, because this term is much more interesting. It is essentially the energy momentum tensor. So the way you should think of this term is as follows. It is more or less the same thing as uh, the Riemann tensor contracted with some gamma matrices. So I think what I want to do, first of all, is to invent a simple lemma that uh, shows you how contracting the Riemann tensor with some gamma matrices gives you the Einstein tensor and hence the energy momentum tensor after the use of the Einstein equations. So let's consider a vector field which I will call ZD, and it's equal to R, D, A, E, F, gamma A, gamma E, gamma F. Okay. 
That thing, you can use the cyclic identity on the Riemann tensor to rewrite. This thing looks like it ought to be extremely complicated, but in fact is extremely easy. So, using the cyclic identity, you can replace this Riemann tensor by minus RD, and then you'll have EFA plus RDFAE, multiplied by gamma A, gamma E, gamma F. Now, what I can do for each of these terms is to permute these gamma matrices to end up back with a Z. There are two such terms. Let's look at the f first one, R D E F A. To get gamma E F A, I've got to commute this gamma through this one and then through that one. So there are two sign changes. So you end up with gamma E, gamma F, gamma A. From commuting the A and the E, you will end up with plus 2 G A E gamma F. And for commuting the, now you, of course you have E A F, you need to commute the A and the F, you will end up with minus 2 G A F gamma E. And then you can recognize this thing here as just being Z again. Then there is this term here, R D F A E. To get F A E, you have got to send this gamma matrix through these two gamma matrices here. So you'll end up with gamma F A E. You want to commute these two, so I'll get a 2 G E F times a gamma A. That will give me, going in the order A, F, E. Now I've got to commute these two. A with F, so I'll end up with minus 2 G, A, F, gamma, E. So that's the net answer. So, collect up terms. And this thing is equal to minus 2 Z, D. Then you contract A with E. If you contract A with E on this Riemann tensor, you'll end up with the Ricci tensor. So you'll end up with minus 2 R, D, F, gamma, F. Then we have G, A, F here. But this Riemann tensor is anti-symmetric under the interchange of its last two indices. Contract it with GAF, you'll get nothing. So this term gives you nothing. Similarly, um, here we have 2GEF. That's going to give me here the Ricci tensor with an A and a D. So you end up with minus 2R. Um, let's see. EF gives me AD. So it's D, A, gamma, A. That's another one of these terms. Then I get this thing, minus, minus. So it gives me a plus 2. G, A, F, well that contracts the second and third index on the Riemann tensor, so I get minus the Ricci tensor. So I get a third minus sign, minus R, D, E, gamma, E. All of these things are the same. So that tells you that this combination ZD, where it gives you 3ZD, is equal to minus 6RDE gamma E. So you've found that the thing that shows up here, a Riemann tensor contracted with three gammas, is something really rather simple involving the Ricci tensor. How does that help us with this thing?
well, we have z is equal to minus 2r d e gamma e. Let's do one further calculation here. Let's multiply this by gamma d. We will need that shortly. That thing, that's the same as minus 2r d e gamma e gamma d. You can replace this by the anti-commutator. So this is equal to minus twice the Ricci scalar. So let's now use that information to look at this object here. We have H, C, D, H, A, B, R, D, B, E, F, gamma, C, A, gamma, E, F. That's the thing that we would like to simplify. This is the same thing as from the definition of H, G, C, D, plus T, C, T, D, gamma, sorry, G, A, B, plus T, T, B, R, D, D, E, F. Now, we want to be a bit careful about this. This is anti-symmetric under the interchange of C and A. Here, this is anti-symmetric under the interchange of D and B. So when you end up with H, C, D, H, A, B, you could replace that by the anti-symmetric part here, and it won't make any difference. So this bit, you can do, since this is anti-symmetric, you can do away with the fact that you have got anti-symmetrization there and replace it by gamma C, gamma A. So that comes about by the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. Similarly, you can replace this by gamma E, gamma F, because this thing is anti-symmetric under the interchange of E and F. So you end up with this. Now, that, of course, is basically the same thing as Z. So, collect up terms again. We have GAB, GCD, R, D, B, E, F, gamma, gamma, E, gamma, F. There's a term involving T, C, T, D, G, A, B. Then there's the other one, there's G, C, D, T, A, T, B. And lastly, there's a thing involving four T's, T, A, T, B, T, C, T, D. R, D, B, E, F. Gamma E, gamma F. This last term is obviously zero because I have got TB, TD, RDB. This thing is anti symmetric under the interchange of D and B. This is symmetric, so that term goes away. The first term is indeed nothing more or nothing less than our old friend Z. We have got a CD and an AB, so that turns this thing into CA. And we have just worked out that that's the same thing as the Ricci scalar. This term here 
G-A-B-R-D-B-E-F turns this into an A, then that contracts with three of these gamma matrices, giving me plus T-C-T-D-R-D-A-E-F, gamma A, gamma E, gamma F, and the third term gives me another one that's exactly the same. So, this object here are C, A, E, F, gamma C, gamma A, gamma E, gamma F, is the same thing as Z, D, gamma D, so this gives me minus twice the Ricci scalar. This term here, this is just Z, D, so I end up with minus four, Sorry? Gamma C. I'm missing a gamma C. Correct. Minus four T C T D. And then we have R. Uh, D. You got me confused. That's right. R, D, E, gamma C, gamma D. I have too many Ds. Why has that happened? T, C, D, R, that should be a D. That's right. So um, that one should be an E, shouldn't it? I think it's worked out right. This is R contracted with three gamma matrices. So in that order, so the gamma C comes out the front. You get minus from the definition of ZD up there, minus two. So I get minus four R Ricci tensor contracted with a gamma matrix. So I think that is right. So, you can now substitute in using the Einstein equations to rewrite this in terms of the energy momentum tensor. Recall that RAB minus a half R of GAB is equal to 8 pi times the energy momentum tensor. So, the easy way to rewrite this is... Um, well, let's see. Probably the easiest thing to do is to write this in two bits, isn't it? If you take the trace of this thing using the metric, you'll end up with R minus 4 over 2, so it's minus the Ricci scalar, is equal to 8 pi times the energy momentum, trace of the energy momentum, so I can write it like that. Or alternatively, whenever I see RAB, I can write this as 8 pi TAB plus 1 half of RGAB, so that's minus 4 pi GAB times the trace of the energy momentum tensor, and just substitute into that whole mess. I don't want to erase that. And the bottom line is plus 16 pi times the trace of the energy momentum tensor. That's this term here. Then you have minus 4 TCTD. RDE, that's 8 pi times TDE minus 4 pi times GDE times the trace of the energy momentum tensor. And then a gamma C, gamma E. That's the same thing as 16 pi times the trace of the energy momentum tensor minus 4 TC, T, 32 pi TC, TD, TDE, gamma C, gamma E. And then from here, a plus 16 pi trace of the energy momentum tensor GDE. 
I can replace by TD, TC, TE, gamma C, gamma E. But TCE, gamma C, gamma E is our old friend minus 1 by replacing this by the metric, because it's metric. And so what happens is that that term cancels at that term, leaving me with nothing more than the energy momentum tensor. So you are left with a term which looks like gravitational energy, a term here which looks like the energy momentum tensor of matter, and some junk which is all going to cancel out. Um, I have to stop because uh, Michael Green has arrived. I'll finish this off on Monday.